You're listening to Reach Teach Talk with Nat Dane. I'm here today in London with Mr. Rob Lowe, Dr. Rob Lowe, who is the CEO of the Relationships Foundation based in Cambridge, UK. And this is our first of the five London episodes is what I'm calling it. Let's, let's call this like the London mini series. Right. This is the UK mini series for uh, Reach, Teach, Talk. And I'm thrilled because Rob, this, there was nobody I could think of to help start, to be the starting guest, the first guest for the London series. Um, I cannot think of anybody better than Rob. And the reason why is personal and professional. Um, I met Rob about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago now. (laughs) And I just finished the manuscript for Time to Teach, Time to Reach. And I just kind of sent a blind query because I did some searches on relational schools in in the UK and and any sort of think tanks or any sort of university um, kind of programs and professors uh, that are really keen on the, the, the importance of relationships in schools, in the classroom. And Rob responded. I found Rob through his website at Relational Schools. At the time, he was the, the head, the director of Relational Schools Foundation, which I'll let Rob kind of go into the weeds on this a little bit later, but it is an extension um, from the Relationship Foundation. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyhow, so I reached out to you. You responded. You were heading to Australia, uh, and you took the manuscript with you. And what were your thoughts? <laughs> you can you can actually pick up the story here. Right. <clears throat> So we had maybe two years before that published a book um, called The Relational Teacher, and that was trying to capture some of the narratives of teachers in this space who really loved um, to think intentionally about their sort of the, the social climate of classrooms. And we'd done something very small scale with one school. But here's what somebody would send me um, a manuscript based on 100 interviews um, with teachers, not just from one school, but from a range of schools, you know, K through 12 in the in the US and elsewhere. And so, therefore, I was immediately impressed by the scope of the manuscript um, and the robustness of the qualitative data. This was something, because of that size, that was going to say imp- something important into this space. And it was beautifully structured. There was It was meaty. And if there's anything that's true about our organisation, we exist as, as servants to other people. We're here to try and encourage people to think like this. But there's always that question that people come to us with afterwards, which is, OK, you've been able to show us what our our culture and climate like is like in this classroom but what next and for me you represent and um, reach academics represents the what next um the, the narrative the conversation yeah so this is me uh <laughs> counting my money that i'm going to put under the table for rob notice this isn't a great british pounds and, and here you go thank you so much thank for the you. positive accolades um i'll get you a pint or two at the pub uh, thank you after so this much. as well um but in all seriousness Rob and I hit it off um, immediately when we finally met and to, to, we worked on the edits for the book and he wrote this incredible foreword for the book. And uh, while this is not meant to be a, you know, buy the book um, uh, episode, it is more just to, to kind of share our connection. And plus, you can't you can't beat Nat Damon and Rob Lowe. No, I mean, count, right? right? I mean, <laughs> come on. It's, it's, if you can't get Matt, it's Nat, not Matt. If you can't get Rob Lowe with a different spelling, um, you got the two of us. We're the educator versions. We're the educational doppelgangers. Absolutely. We're the famous ones. We are the, we are the famous ones. <laughs> <laughs> in our own studio. Look at us. We have a sign and everything. Um, but anyhow, welcome to the London episodes of uh, Reach Teach Talk. And Rob, I'm thrilled to have you here Thanks because you, let, let's take a step back now and let yeah. me shine the spotlight on you too. Um, you are, in my mind, uh, somebody who has been able to do what I had previously thought impossible, which is to find ways to use quantitative measurements to assess mm. the qualitative strengths, the relational strengths in schools. And I would love for you to kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of share, update me, update the listeners and the viewers about what you've been able to achieve with Relational Schools Foundation, again, as a subset of the Relationship Foundation. And how many schools have you worked with? What have you been able, how have you, how have you been able to use quantitative mm. measurements to assess something that has, in my mind, just been so qualitative? Yeah, so. sure. Thank you. So um, let me take you back to the to the to the way in which I interacted with this story in the first place. So um, back in 2012, May 2012, I went to listen to a public lecture um, given by our founder, 
um, Dr. Michael Schluter, who'd, who'd worked across um, several different sectors and geographies, um, doing all sorts of extraordinary things. I went to this this public lecture, which at the time, um, it, it, was a, it was actually a lecture on economics. Um, and I shouldn't have even gone. I went at the r- request and invitation of a friend. And I went reluctantly, if I'm honest. Why did you go? You're, you're, you're more of a humanities guy, yeah, so, right? So he, so he had invited somebody else who worked for a bank. The guy had dropped out. Um, he said, I don't want to go by myself. Will you come with me? And he's a good friend. So I went. And uh, I listened to the to this lecture, this public lecture, which was about um, the need to reframe public policy to encourage um, harmony and proximity in organisational life and public life. And he spoke, uh, Dr. Schluter spoke about work in prisons. Um, Relationships Foundation, their first project was this wonderful audit of relationships between um, prisons and guards to try and understand, measure the culture of prisons um, in order to produce predict the likelihood of writing and stop it well before. It was the first foray 30 years ago into predictive analytics. Um, so I'm sat there thinking about, you know, I'm already I'm already interested, you know. Um, and then he said, well, that was back in the early 90s. And then they went to work on in uh, the measurement of relationships in hospitals and then in peace building context, pre-truth and reconciliation in South Africa, post-conflict Rwanda, I work in Sudan, currently doing work in on the Korean Peninsula. Um, They'd done work in businesses. KPMG had, um, at that time, been the largest worldwide licensees of these of these audit tools, these metrics. But he makes this throwaway comment at the end, uh, which is, but we've never done a thing in schools. We've never found anybody to do that for us before. And so I run up to him afterwards, and there's, there's all sorts of personal and professional reasons. And, and part of those are my difficulties in, in, in forming and creating relationships at schools. I did not find that easy. Um, Why not? Just, so I don't, I don't suppose I'll ever know why. I just know that it was a factor. I, just, I didn't experience relationships um, of, of, of mutual reinforcement easily at school. Is this you as a student or you it's as a teacher? It's me as a student. Okay. Um, and, and so when I left university, having studied education policy, I just really wanted to be a teacher because I wanted, because what, because what I knew was at school, the reason that I did make good friends is because there was, there was an intervention of a third party that helped me do that. So it was either teachers who looked out for you, it was my parents. You know, you know when we were talking earlier, I, I gave you the great example. If, if you want someone to be friends with somebody else, the best thing you do as a parent is just invite them around for tea you know and so my mum was really intentional about that you know you'd have people over for tea and and in order to stimulate and nurture those kinds of relationships and I kind of you know having experienced the positive third party intervention of somebody else saying look this is how you do it this is how you incentivize it encourage it I wanted to be the relational teacher and I wanted to um I wanted to help other people in that quest and I wanted and I could see from all those students around me, that those who really thrived had really good, strong connections with the, with the professionals who taught them, and I wanted to be that person. So I'm at the back of this hall thinking this would play out really well in school. So I ran up to him afterwards and said, at the time I'd been a head of English, faculty head of English, and assistant principal at a large college, and within a year I'd given all that up without the promise of a first-year salary uh, to go and set up what was then called Relational Schools Project. It was just an incubated project um, uh, that, that sought to try and test these metrics out in schools. And then from that, you know, we, we've gone from working with just one school and 20 children to, I mean, I work in Australia. We've worked with tens of thousands of children in Australia and Canada now. And, um, yeah, and we've measured tens of thousands of relationships between students, between teachers and students, and it has become the largest and, and, and other people argue the most successful um, iteration of these tools. Um, and, I, and for obvious reasons, because teachers love this stuff. They understand it's the reason they became teachers in the first place. However much you love your subject, however much you love teaching the knowledge of your subject or, or having a curriculum that is that is well-focused and balanced, ultimately teachers are in it for the human beings in the in 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 the, in the place it's not an organization it's an organism it's living it's it's alive and 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 teachers get their buzz from that organism you know and a lot of what you're what you're saying is you know this is the reason why we like I was a teacher for for many years as yeah. well and why we get into the profession to begin with and one of the many outcomes of your work with the relational schools foundation is 
helping to reset the spotlight on what's most important and to help support teachers. Because, as you say, and it's so true, I mean, this is we, we get into this job not for the money and not for status. It's to do to do good with the next generation, to work with kids, to, you know, and to have that. And you can't do that effectively without building a strong relationship with them Absolutely. first, right? Right. And and what's more is that since I began teaching in the late 90s, um, we the culture of many schools now is so quantitative. Um, we we tend not to manage the things we don't measure. And so it's not that teachers don't care or recognize about the importance of relationships. In fact, it's probably the most profound challenge we have when trying to talk to schools about relationships, because you have two responses to that. One is, um, do you know what? We see that's important, but we've got this other stuff that's more important. And it's, 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 it's assessment data. It's the metrics around performance and outcomes. Or perhaps the most challenging is the teacher that says, no, 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 we're really good at relationships here. And uh, it's all right, we got, we got this. Um, that's more profoundly challenging because it's not until you put a number next to a relationship and understand not only how good that relationship genuinely is, but also some of the underlying fragility behind that relationship that you can begin to act intentionally and positively um, into that space. And so what we've been trying to do is take our metrics to take something that is inherently intangible and make it known and knowable um, and actionable. Um, And that's why these metrics are so important in a culture with foregrounds and values, the empirical. Um, It gives people permission, but it also gives people a starting point um, to be intentional. That's that's absolutely awesome because, you know, we, we are living in this age where thanks to technology, you know, we can split algorithms, we can aggregate information, we can, you know, post these metrics that look beautiful and glorious and are incredibly nuanced and incredibly um, fine-tuned yet (laughs) it's it's almost we've we've now been conditioned to take um more seriously uh studies or um feedback that has as you say that number next to it absolutely and and i absolutely agree with you it's schools that have the the pride or the hubris the hubristic kind of oh we got relationships we do this already like or Maybe also embedded in that, Rob, is this idea that relationships are soft skills. And, yes. you know, oh, really, no, but it, this is, it's just, you kind of breathe it through the, through the ethos here. You know, we, we don't really need to define it because it's, it's just there. Sure. Right? And, 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 but even in the context of, of your book, you know, which is you know, a group of educators are saying, do you know what? When I do this, when I do intervention A, I think relationships improve. When I do intervention B, um, actually they get worse, you know, and, and these are things not to do. In reality, some of these things um, are definitely true true and knowable. But in a context where we have something like the Education Endowment Foundation in England, um, which has tried to bring a kind of red pill, blue pill mentality, medical research mentality to, to educational intervention, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's good for us to understand what genuinely lies behind best practice. But in that culture... It's very hard for somebody to pick up your book, I think, and say, well, actually, here's intervention A, B and C. I'm going to follow those because they're in a in a wider, broader culture where people say, well, prove that. Right. Right. Where's your evidence that that works? And ultimately, what we are starting to see is that there is a there is an impact of year group size um, on on relationship quality. Um, We know now that. when you add for every class you add per year, we see a degrading relationships amongst students by about four percent. So, so <clears> to put this into a America example, speak here, um, we're, we, when he talks about your group, Rob, you're talking about um, grade levels. I am right? talking about grade levels. Yeah. That's right. So the the in, so you've you found in your studies um, that the larger the grade level, there's a certain number that you don't want to necessarily cross. Yeah. Because you lose the relationship, exactly the relational right. connection, and you and you start to you start to see that degrading of relationship um, uh, once that tipping point has been reached. Um, or, for example, more positively, what we've seen is that there is an enormous impact in taking young people away outside of the classroom um, on longer trips, on on expeditions, on residentials. So, so, so one can say, well, this is a quantifiable intervention. Here's something that lots of schools do every year. They spend money on it. They inv- invite parents to spend. Money Money on it, um, but what's the impact of it? And what we're trying to do is is put numbers, empirical data around something, so that the soft, intangible, 
um, elements of school culture and practice can themselves um, be treated exactly the same way um, as a reading, a six-week reading program intervention, or or the use of of of, of, of peer mentors, um, all those kinds of fantastic things where where we have got that evidence base we feel it's important to have the same evidence based on the on the things that other people just think implicitly are important about school culture and life. This is fantastic because in a time where people are looking for, you know, the, the auditors are looking for areas of the budget, of a school budget to trim, to skim, to s- siphon off, retreats, field trips, <laughs> shared experiences are among the first things in arts programs and whatnot are among the first things to go, right? Ex- you know, after school programs, we would call them here in the U.S., Yet, what you're able to provide now by putting the numbers next to the value, uh, the valued assessments, the survey approach to these these experiential based, but so critical for relationship building um, components of, of the school. That's that's huge, right? That is really big. Yeah. I mean, take t- for example. You know, just the concept of the pastoral, which I, which I am, I am a really passionate. In fact, actually, it, um, the book I want to write next is a, is about the importance of pastoral structures in schools because they are one of the things that have been cut. Um, so people start to cut away at time for the pastoral. So for some people, the pastoral in a school is forty five minutes every day. It's the lifeblood of student culture. It's the place where you have a touchstone with one professional has an, an oversight of your academic and personal well-being across across your entire school experience and they invest in that time really intentionally we've got some great case studies on that for other schools um there is no pastoral structure at all in fact it's one of the things when we've been doing some work in canada recently one of the things we've noticed and one of the things we really struggled with it was very hard to go and do our measurement um, in one focused place because there was there was that there wasn't that consistency between schools. For one school, yeah, yeah, we do the pastoral and it's this. For another, it's just five minutes in the beginning of the day and it's roll call and administration. For for others, it's like, what do you even mean by the pastoral? Um, now, I make no judgment about that. What we're saying is when we see um, really strong pastoral cultures in schools with real value given to mentoring of young people, we see different outcomes, social outcomes in young people. We see better levels of mental health and well-being. We see better cohesion between students. So therefore, until we have that debate around, well, what is the importance of the pastoral? Why must it be in every school? No, no, no. They will always go for that as a first place to cut, because if their primary job of a school is to in- increase math scores, then you invest in math. Um, because it is the thing that we know based on this red pill, blue pill kind of mentality that if we do this, we do that, we do that, math scores go up. But ultimately, sure, we're interested in math scores going up. We're not, you know, we're not Luddites. We, we, we see that that level of progress academically is important. It's important for life chances. It's important for mobility of students socially. But at the same time, we have to be aware that internationally, young people are not as happy as they were. Um, that levels um, of, 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 you know, levels of subjective well-being um, are on the downturn, that young people are telling us that they feel lonelier than ever before, they feel more isolated, they feel more unhappy. Now, we have to find a system that encourages both of those things to be in healthy tension. How can I succeed academically? How can I progress and have job opportunities and career opportunities that make me feel fulfilled. But at the same time, how can I also be cradled and held at these really developmental you know, early adolescence, that shift particularly um, between the ages of 10, 11, 12, 13, that, that period there. You know, in the in the United Kingdom, you know, where I come from, that, that, that leap from what we might call primary to secondary is utterly crucial. What we know is now that if you are not in a good relationship with at least one other peer and with with an adult in the school, you are highly unlikely, by the time you are 10 or 11, you're highly unlikely to transfer successfully to secondary school. You're highly unlikely to form those relationships again. And these are the young people who become socially excluded for the rest of their lives. And we know this stuff now, and yet we are not yet having an intentional debate uh, about how to deal with that, um, how, how to intentionally improve that picture. It's, uh, wow, there's so many things that I'm thinking about as you're speaking so eloquently about the impact and the importance of the impact on um, the the socially based programs 
or elements of a school um, of a school culture. So, just when Rob's talking about pastoral, you're talking about um, in the U.S. we call it advisory programs or even homeroom. Yeah, the right? homeroom is the best metaphor yeah. for it. I like it. We don't use the word actually, and I love the word more because I think there is a place where a young person should feel at home each day. Amen. Yeah. Um, and 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 also the idea that you know. <laughs> Skeptics who are looking strictly at curricular, um, uh, uh, optimal curriculum will understandably uh, say, hey, you know what, a homeroom program or pastoral focus, focus on the pastoral, we don't have enough time to do that because really we need to increase their math scores. Let's just focus on math or focus on English or you know, whatnot, things that are data-driven and that are standardized test-driven. Um, uh I, I spoke with um, Andrea Zafiraku, who is an art teacher, and she's she's the teacher of the year and the global teacher of the year in 2018. And she's an art teacher. And she made this point about art as being as saying, hey, look, you know, art is art. There's math in art. There is absolute communication in art. There's there is uh, logic to art. There is storytelling in art. There is, and if you're talking about art appreciation and criticism, there is you know argumentative um, you know rhetoric in art. Why are we, and then why are we chopping it off? Why are we chopping off another portal for learning that skills that fall under the concrete core curricula? So that as well as I guess I'm thinking of as reason for why what your work achieves is so incredibly important in this day and age so layered on top of everything is this idea of the tech the technology that we're that we're living in today and our reliance Mm -hmm. on technology and our faith in technology to be able to expose strengths and weaknesses in school programs and school culture and then also a subset of that would be looking at curriculum and looking at a school where they put their priorities. And yes, we want our, our school to to do well um, when it comes to outcomes, standardized testing outcomes. But isn't aren't there aren't there other ways to go about um, strengthening a school curriculum, not just by hammering kids over with math exercises and you know English grammar exercises, flashcards, memorization, writing, rewriting, rewriting. All that's important but not at the expense of arts programs, not at the expense of home room programs that are thoughtfully designed, not at the expense of retreats and off-campus opportunities where kids grow in ways that might not be obvious and apparent to the, um, the auditor. But thanks to your work, you're able to externalize, make external and make palatable to the quantitative thinkers, um, the importance of, of these other other facets of the school day. Yeah, and you know what? Um, if so, one of the one of the um, the new measures I argued for um, some time ago now in a book called Flip the System is uh, a new measure of of school success, which we would call the Destination Seven measure. And this is based on the premise that if you went to find young people seven years after they'd left school, what would you really want to see? I mean, you assume, let's just take it for, you know, for granted that they they can read and write. We expect literacy and numeracy. Sure. I mean, if you go back to, you know, the, the first societies, particularly biblical society, um, uh, people, there were 100% rates of literacy and numeracy. There was, a, there was a culture where everyone could read and write. We just assume that this, this is an important part of, of, of human functioning and living. But what else do you want to see? Well, for me, I'd want to see people settled. You know, emotionally so. You mean emotionally so, right? Right? so th- that they might own or at least be renting a house. They might be awesome. employed. That they might be voting, volunteering. Maybe they're married. Maybe they have a partner. Um, that they're happy. Um, that then in some way that they are. Well, the Greeks used to call this eudaimonia, right? It's, it's the idea. Term. Of, it's, Love that term. It's eudaimonia. flourishing. These yep. guys are flourishing. Yep. And that's what you want to see. Yep. And so some of that is is seeing the absence of certain things. So you know, if you're looking at risk averse behaviours, you know, excessive, you know. Uh, drink, drugs, alcohol, weaponized crime, all those kinds of things which are um, sociological determiners of whether people are struggling. Right. So if you want to see those things, then what kind of education do you put in place to see those things 
happening seven years down the line. I'm not necessarily sure you'd set up education in exactly the same way that we do it now. And what we're trying to do, and I think we will need to do more of this, is think longitudinally about different types of school experiences in order to to really have this debate about what does human flourishing look and feel like um, and, and how do we best achieve it. Because ultimately, if you don't want people to take drugs because you consider it to be a risk behaviour that's worth avoiding or excessive alcohol because we know um, the damage it can do, well, then you would definitely have a really good programme of, of, of education of this in school. It wouldn't be something that you just do incidentally and, and, and through an advisory programme if you've got time. If a school um, had a Destination 7 measure against it, which said, do you know what, you're not responsible for, but we're really interested in understanding the link between the education and experience they had here and where they went. You know, a school would be more intentional about apprenticeship, about movement into further education, because if if one of the things they were judged, I don't, no, I don't like the word judge, if one of the things, if one of the conversations we had with schools um, was around those destinations where children ended up, I think we might think differently about the programs we put in place to achieve that. Wow. Oh, my goodness. OK, so this idea of the, of the school of tomorrow, Rob, um, having the ability or let's just say having the focus on every graduate seven years later being being in an area of eudaimonia, being in, and, and when we say flourishing, I mean, it's not like rah, rah, you know, everything is wonderful because we know that happiness is, is not about that either. It's, it's contentment. It's a feeling, right, of, of, of there's value in my being. Right. There's yeah. value in my being. I'm not coming from a place of scarcity. Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm not attaching myself to if I have this, then I'll actually be happy. I have this. I, and, and it's been reinforced in my schooling. A couple of questions for you, then. Do you believe then, Rob, that that the the ages in which we are in school are incredibly formative? And do you believe in this idea that school your one school life impacts how they are as adults? I definitely do. And perhaps the scariest thing is that. I think some of these outcomes are fixed when we are really young. Like primary school. Yeah. Elementary. So, yeah. So, I, th- I, I, you know, there's lots of studies to say that some of our later sort of employment or, or social outcomes are fixed at the age of seven, yeah. that you can start yeah. to predict children's test scores by the books they have on their shelves at home and and so therefore you know one of the things i mean so this i mean i don't want to age this podcast by referencing something that is in the moment but right now in the moment we've just seen the pisa results um, released for 2019 just this week just this week and everyone's talking about estonia why are they talking about estonia they're talking about estonia because um estonia has seen a meteoric rise up the uh, other pisa tables and what do we know about estonia so sure um again a a little like um you know perhaps finland we've been very interested about Finland for some time now. Um, culturally, more homogenous. It's very small. Um, I think about about 1.3 million uh, sort of population. But the thing that really interests me is just the amount of investment they put into their early years. You know, they they invest heavily financially and relationship relationally in young children. Um, and you know that was that was definitely true of Finland. You see the, the expenditure on on special educational needs provision, which is a very broad term in Finland, is massive when children are young. Um, in the United Kingdom, what we see is we see this upward upward curve of investment, which gets even steeper um, as children reach the ages of fifteen and sixteen. In Finland, that is a that's a downward trend. They invest heavily at the start and a, a small upturn at the end. Um, but the principle of it is, if you invest early you reap the dividends later so if anything we're seeing now is that sure you might have to invest two or three times the amounts we're seeing now in school in order to give the levels of support and nurture that all children need but it would have to come simultaneously with a with a rebalancing of investment which has to be heavy early on um yeah, the the Australians call this the billabong effect. You know, so if you have if you have a stagnant pond, um, then what you need to do is you need to go upstream, and usually what you'll find is that there is a dead animal somewhere in that stream, and it just needs to be cleared, moved away, and fresh water will flow again. And we must understand that in order to impact young people's lives at the ages of 14, 15, 16, you have to invest heavily at the ages of four, five, and six. Um, and, and I think when we realise that and appreciate that, we will see 
different outcomes um, later later down the line. There's a great organization in the U.S. called Defending the Early Years, which Nancy Carlson Page, who is Matt Damon's mother, um, not Matt Damon, yeah. um, she runs this uh, nonprofit, and she's a professor at um, Lesley University, which is one of the great education universities in the U.S. And she, her whole life has been as a professor of, of, of early education and also as a spokesperson for really preaching this message, as you are, about the primacy of the early years and how incredibly critical it is to get this. And if we can invest more money in you know, Head Start programs in the U.S., for example, Head Start programs or certainly primary uh, schools and programs to help bring raise all ships um, at that young at, at a young age, we will be a healthier and better uh, society for sure. This this notion of this you said earlier Rob, about um, school size, about grade level sizes, mm-hmm. and I want to get back to that because it relates to what you're talking about here, um, in the sense that. You were talking about you were kind of conflating the loneliness, uh, uh, kind of uh, the focus on loneliness here in the UK is is huge, and um, it's recently huge. It's it's really looking at the idea that twenty five percent of pensioners or, or folks I think sixty or sixty five and older yeah. don't have anybody saying <clears throat> giving them a phone call on Christmas, right? Like they're alone at the holidays, and they uh, and, and this loneliness is is just it has physical manifestations, it's got emotional uh, sense of self manifestations, and um, and health manifestations schools would what's your thoughts about how a school should should what's your discoveries about in your research about loneliness in schools and what happens to a student who is marginalized or invisible i.e lonely in a school what kind of path does that student typically take have you found and how can schools address loneliness in their ecosystems Really good question. So there's <clears throat> two things I'd say about that. One, we've developed a new way of um, looking at this. So we've developed some social network analysis mapping tools, which map um, both the kind of relationships between all students in classrooms. And then we also have like a thermal imaging sort of tool, which measures well-being on top of that. And so we can start to see where the where the heat maps are of, of real sadness amongst young people can you explain um, that a little bit we find this through words because most people would be listening yeah here. yeah good so yeah. so basically what we do is is using our relational proximity framework tool and we ask every child in the class one question about their relationship to everybody else and they must answer that one question sometimes one sometimes more and then what we can start to do is correlate that um and by and and there's some machine learning in it so what the, what the program does then it isolates those students who have no connections where there's really strong connections between students we see the nodes on the maps grow and strengthen we see lines emerge between them and what you can start to see is where the children are really connected where they're fragmented and why so so if i'm if i'm saying this right so i think i've seen this before um through you uh it's a scattergram of of students like every student is a dot in the mm-hmm. name or initials or whatever numbers and then you literally are drawing lines connecting them right yeah, that's and you right. can see visibly it's almost like looking at a cell or looking at a yeah. you know and then indeed and because we've then yeah. measured their well-being over the top then we color that map so you can see literally that the heat areas the ones you worry about the redder those students are the more unhappy they are and they, and usually there is a consistency between those who are fragmented and and pushed outside who have few or no connections and those children who are deeply unhappy yes. but then of course because we've got such large data sets we can start to say demographically um sociologically what are the factors that lie behind these young people and there's usually three or four factors that are consistent amongst particularly young people in primary schools, number one, um, that they often live at least one postcode away from the school. So they don't live near the school. And and why is that important? Well, clearly it's important because um, what you notice is that the children who walk together to school tend to spend more time together, they tend to get invited back together because particularly young children, they don't, you know, they're not not as driven as as other children. So because if you can go to somebody else's, else's house for tea who's two or three doors away, you do. And what you notice is that those children who are at least one postcode away, they don't form relationships as well nor, nor do they if they have started mid-year or midway through a school mm-hmm. career if you join a school you on board separately and on board mid-year you're overrepresented in that population if you have weak academic ability you're overrepresented in that in that loneliness population and if you have um, in some countries some kind of difference and particularly this is a language if you have English as an additional language you know we often see this as you, amongst European migrants as well um, in parts of the world then you are likely to be one of those people who doesn't 
don't connect as well and you're pushed to the outside. Now, what does this do? Well, it makes people really intentional about their policy of onboarding children culturally into a school. If you are that child who doesn't live close, who you started midway through the year, that you're weaker academically, that you that you have some kind of difference um, that is completely, um, you know, you can't do anything but just celebrate it, manage it and deal with it, then what do you do? You have to be intentional and you have to think through the strategies that enable that. What the second thing I want to say is, well, what is the consequence of not doing that? Well, the largest project that we are involved in at the moment is a study of alternative provision in England. So these are the places that young people get excluded to. Um, so when they're, if they've been in mainstream school, then the behaviour has been such they've been kicked out. So mm. they're sent to these places where they can be educated um, you know, in a different environment. They're usually smaller. They're high staff student ratios. Um, some of them are semi-secure. You know, these are these are very different sort of um, you know, environments for young people to be. Mm. So what characterises those young people um, and their success and flourishing in these new places? Well, we've interviewed a bunch of them. And, you know, one of, you know what the consistent thing they say is when we ask them the question, what is the difference between the school you came from and the school that you are in now, this organisation, this alternative provision? And their consistent comment is this. Here we feel known. And so what does that tell you about school? You know, the, the whole understanding, the whole measurement of relationships, you don't measure a relationship between two people by the degree to which you like somebody. Relationship measurement is is based on the degree to which you know and are known by somebody else. And and our and our premise is simple: the the more you stimulate an environment which allows people to be known, particularly that's true of teacher student. That's why class size matters. Class size doesn't matter because. It, well, yes, it does matter to the own personal relationships of a teacher because if they have too many papers to grade, too many books to mark, then their their time, their own personal time is going to be stretched. But ultimately, what does a small class do? It allows a teacher to have individual conversations regularly with a young person, which means they know them and they are known. That is that is the point. And what we're seeing is that those young people with particular needs and real difficulties they don't necessarily come um, from the kinds of demographics or home lives um, where they've experienced relationships in a positive um, sense. They've often coming from really difficult home environments and they need nurture in a way that they've not experienced. If you then go into a school that has two, three thousand pupils in it, of course these young people feel lost and they feel marginalised. And and of course they tell us in these environments where there's somewhere between 20 to 50 students, do you know what? Here we feel known, here we feel valued, and here we are flourishing. There's some really important things. And, and so yes, school size is a driver of that class size is a driver of that grade level size is a driver of that um, but there's also some of these demographics things that we see in our in our earlier studies as well that but when we know them when we have tangible data around them we can start being intentional about them this is and this is a political issue i think uh in the states obviously when we have um school shootings which happen well and any time it happens obviously is a horror and a, tra- and a tragedy and a, and, a, and a mandate for us as as Americans to look at ourselves and hold a mirror and ideally in a healthy government we'd be able to form policy around it and uh, and make positive steps toward uh, eradicating this uh, phenomenon this horrific phenomenon. You and I have written in the past about this, like in Education Week, we had an excerpt that was published there a couple of years ago after the um, the shooting in Florida mm-hmm. with Nicholas Cruz, where it was this idea that, and and you can look up also, um, there's a couple of reports that have come out recently, which are also the idea of, of, of the, the, the essential components or the, the, the traits that every school shooter um, has in common. And male disenfranchised, has been expelled uh, from school, uh, does not, but is also more than anything else has been invisible and has a sense of it doesn't matter whether I'm there or not. And clearly you don't care for me to be there because you've kicked me out anyways. Mm. Um, and I do not have a sense of self. I'm hollow in the hollow shell. So and then there's access to guns, and then there's family, broken family life, you know, that factor in as well to these um, these traits and these the, the definitions of, of American school shooters. And uh, so what schools can do, all right, and I bring that up because it is the uh, – to stress the importance, it is about size, not salary. Uh, I wrote a blog once called Hashtag Size Not Salary, which is – it's about classroom size. Like, come on, when, when LAUSD teachers went on strike last winter a year ago and they were protesting for smaller class size over anything else because they're like, look, we cannot know our students with an average of 37 kids in this classroom times five sections. How am I supposed to know my kids and how am I therefore going to be able to do what 
Rob, you're talking about, which is the grace-filled, the human, humanistic, um, educative uh, part component of being um, a, an excellent relational teacher. I want to get back. I think that was really well said, Rob, what you said about just that, that um, and looking at the studies, the heat maps about, you know, how, how it, and especially the example you gave about kind of the, the, the students who have been expelled and, and having them come together and share, you know, this is why I feel happier in this secondary school home because I, I, I know that I'm known. I mean, I'm, there's 50 to 100 of us at, at maximum. There's something you said earlier in this conversation that I want to come back to, and this is a way that we're going to have to start wrapping it up here for time's sake, uh, is you mentioned just in passing the idea of a healthy school being able to also maybe have an apprentice kind of a, 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 an outlet for apprenticeships or mentoring or and, and implicit in what you said, Rob, and I want to have you clarify this yourself, is the role that schools can play for students who, and there are many, who might not be motivated by mass, who might not be looking at a professional degree, um, a university, and then, a, you know, I'll, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be an, an uh, engineer. Students who know that their calling is in something more trade-oriented, mm. right? Um, what's the importance then on school size and schools that are strong in relationships in terms of being able to promote eudaimonia in students seven years hence who are not going to go to uni or who are not going to go into a white collar profession yeah. and that's by choice or by by, yeah. by skill. Let me give you um, an, ex an exemplar of that. So um, one of the most important case studies that we undertook as a, as a project was um, a piece of work with the XP school in Doncaster. Now, XP comes out of expeditionary learning, comes out of the work in the States with Ron Berger, um, EL Education. It was originally a collaboration, I believe, between Harvard Grad School of Education and the Outward Bound Trust. Um, I... I'm, I've got to say, I'm a real evangelist here. I'm not. I'm not on their staff, but I am their. I am a big fan. I'm sorry of Outward Bound, uh, of, or of, of, Outward Bound of, 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 of expeditionary learning, of yep. EL, of Ron, yep. of XP School. What, now, what's his name again? Ron. So people Berger. can look him up. Ron Berger. Look him Amazing. up. He's, he's the founder of expeditionary learning. Yeah. Um, it's connected to Outward Bound, based in Maine, Boston, um, now all and over the place. Yeah, yes. you've probably seen some of his stuff. So if you've ever seen Austin Butterfly, that is Austin's Butterfly, that is Ron. You know, that's an example of of, of just some of the beauty of what they do. Now, so. now we were introduced to XP. I met their their, their really um, outgoing uh, trust CEO, and he said, "Look, yeah, we we were at a conference together, and he said, well, you should come and measure relationships at my school because I reckon we've probably got the best relationships anywhere in the world. Yeah, we do relationships. Yeah, <laughs> and I said, we'll see. Um, <laughs> and uh, Anyway, we measure relationships between them and their teachers, um, between the students themselves. And we I don't think we've measured relationships anywhere internationally better since. I mean, they, it genuinely was an extraordinary community. And it's based on human scale values. These are small schools within schools. The school's never bigger than 350, only 50 in a year group. When they wanted to double the size of the school, what did they do? They built one next door. So they have XP, XP East. They're talking about XP North as an XP Gateshead. They recognize that these small known environments lead to fantastic outcomes. Interestingly, we'd only gone in because I was I was fascinated by one particular intervention, which is um, the use of the expeditionary trip at the beginning of the school year. Mm. Most most schools take young people away um, every year on some sort of trip, but they do it usually at the end of the year. Right, that's right. Just before they're going to break on holidays, you yep. make, you form these great relationships, and then you bust them all up by just going on holiday. What this school did was something more fundamental, and it had a profound impact on the relationships between teachers and students. Even on boarding staff at XP School, they send all the new staff away themselves for a couple of weeks of introduction in the Welsh mountains, just the teachers go away, just so they can bond. And, and you know, they call this, and they call their, their fantastic homeroom structure, they call it crew. And every day, you know, they, they wear these bands, and they're not, they're, it's, not a, it's not trite. It's, this, is, this is not glib. When they say, we are crew, these kids, these teachers, they mean it. And that's what they say. So you hear that phrase, yeah. we are crew, yeah. when and you it, walk and down the hallway. Indeed. You know. And, you know, and, it, and there's something about that, because what, what do we mean by being crew on a ship? Well, it means that there aren't any passengers. Everybody is responsible for everybody else's success and flourishing and growth. And there's something profound about that. But in the EL model, just to your question, which is how do we ensure that there's this real um, progression from the education environment to the outside work? Well, that's the one thing that I loved about EL. And that's around the purpose and beauty of all work. 
and that there is this relationship with school and the community in which it sits and that everything they do has some kind of resonance and purpose to the people around it. And so what young people are doing every day in their projects, which are always outward focused, is is doing something that is good and beautiful and that means something to somebody else. And through that, you know, what, what those at the, within the movement say is that we don't necessarily see the distinction between you know, blue colour, white colour, those kinds of things. But what we do want is young people to be university or college ready. And that's our job. And then what they do, however, is up to them. But what we've given them through this particular programme is a taste of whatever they do that it would be for somebody else's service. Ron Berger says, we made a film about XP School, and Ron Berger said so powerfully in, in the film we made, you know, we're not here to encourage young people to be smart. We're not encouraging people to be wealthy. We are helping young people be able to do good in the world, you know, which is which is back to the flourishing Back to the flourishing point. And so, you know, I don't, I'm not here to plug what we did, but if you really want to look at that, you ought to go in and explore um, the materials, you know, we created around the XP school, not because, as I said, I sit on their board, but just because we think it's a very special model of education, which is doing some really great things. And if you look at iterations of that, if you look at the Polaris school, you should, you know, which is Chicago and some of their work on, on, on creating peaceful neighbourhoods, some extraordinary work about young children reclaiming Parkland space um, back from those who had taken it away from them. And every day in Chicago, uh, every year in Chicago, rather, so I understand, um, there is a day um, when the Polaris School and their children, they go into this big parkland, which is which is often sort of an, an off, you know, an, an, out, an out of bound kind of place for young people to go now. Right. They take it over and they run fate there. They, they run activities there. And it is known to be one of the lowest, if not the lowest crime days in the States. You know, and this is young people saying, this is our community, this is our neighbourhood, we're going to do good and beautiful things in it. And the school has given them a vehicle and model to do that. And it is relational, it is future orientated. Um, it's amazing. And I think there's something ironic about the idea that you, by taking students out um, and putting them on retreat or, or having them outside in the wilderness or out of the school structure for a few days even, actually has a positive impact on the school environment itself. Absolutely. Once they come back, they've they've kind of built up these 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 I'll I'll say crew, I'll say tribal relationships. It gets me thinking actually about a conversation that I'll be having shortly with um a teacher and a writer Adrian Bethune who uh cites in his work, he he wrote a book called Mindfulness in the Primary Classroom and he cites Louis Cozzolino, who's a professor at Pepperdine University in Los Angeles who really talks and focuses his work on on part of his work on the importance of tribe in the classroom and hmm. building a tribal classroom and um, getting the politics out of the word tribe and actually looking at tribe for a 100% bene beneficial reasons, uh, um, positive incarnations of the, of the word tribe, because it's all about belonging. I think it's all about belonging. Adrian's work, and I've heard him speak about the tribal classroom, I think... I think it is really great and powerful stuff. The only thing that I think we need to be better at as educators is trying to find the commonalities and synergies within our tribe. You know, that, you know, that on the one hand that you could, you know, that people will be listening to this podcast and they'll think, well, here's, here's a specific and distinct movement and we need to get involved with this. Then what we might also do is go and listen to the guys in positive education or slow education or whole education. We ought to go and listen to the stuff about tribal education. Ultimately, what we're all talking about is a very, very similar thing. And we need to be better within our community at recognising um, that if we continue to speak with lone and fragmented voices, um, then we will always be quiet people, um, you know, just just shouting behind a closed door. Whereas actually the groundswell of knowledge, understanding, belief in the importance of, of reaching you know, students in this way of being intentional about relationships with students is massive. It's international. Um, there are lots of people speaking in this space. So why this podcast series is important because it's a because what you're starting to do is gather, you know, several people across a series of weeks who are all speaking from the you know from the same page from they're singing the same song. And the more we do that together, the more we won't have this kind of polemic debate between traditional progressive, mm -hmm. between the academic or the pastoral or the, or the homeroom. It, we will understand that one is the foundation of the other, that when people genuinely connect in school, 
when when they are known personal communities. The philosopher Stern, who's a, a York University professor here, he, he said that what schools should be is places or abodes for an unforgettable past with teachers that you'll always remember, um, with children who are like your peers or like siblings. Um, and, and that's what great schools, they are positive personal organisations where children fundamentally are treated as an end in themselves and not a means to an end. Yeah. Schools are organizations and organisms, getting back to what yeah. you said earlier in this conversation about um, schools and their definitions. And um, the book by Adrian Bethune is Well-Being in the Primary Classroom, yes. Well-Being in the Primary Classroom. Um, and the book for Rob uh, for the Relational Schools Foundation is called The Relational Teacher, uh, The Relational Teacher. And uh, Rob, we can keep going and going on this because it is just so awesome we often to do. have you here. We often do, exactly. <laughs> I just feel like we removed the pub, we removed the pints, yeah. um, and here we are with the two mics instead. Yeah. And uh, But I hope that this is something where anybody listening, anybody watching can visit the Relationship Foundation website, uh, the subset, subsite Relational Schools Foundation website. You can just Google it. You can, you can get on there. Um, look at the resources and get a really good understanding for yourselves about how Rob and his organizations and his team and his tribe um, with RSF has been able to really use quantitative metrics to assess the absolute critical and the most val valuable parts of learning, which is opening up the heart and the, the social being, um, as well as the mind, which, all, which can only be done through strengthening relationships, teacher to student, student to student, teacher to teacher, parent to school, uh, administrator to teacher. There's so many constituencies in schools. Important. It's all mm. important. So, Rob, if you want to, I'll leave it with you with a final word, um, but just thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, just thanks very much for having me. Um, you know, the Relationships Foundation has been set up over the last 25 years to incubate new organisations. Um, that's been our posture. We've set up new organisations to work in different sectors. Um, but then this next season, you know, we don't really want to be the heroes of the story. We want to be the guys. We want to be the servants of other people. And so it's been a pleasure and privilege helping you publish your book, um, you know, connecting you to people um, because it's quite clear that Reach Academics is doing some great things. The podcast series is, is a brilliant example of that. So all power to you. Let's, um, yeah, the more teachers who appreciate and become intentional about this practice, yes. the better schools will be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And the better our future, our future will be too, because this generation is going to be working with us um, before we know it. And yeah, yeah. Uh, that's going to be important. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rob Lowe. And uh, again, welcome to the London episodes of uh, Reach Teach Talk. You've been listening to Reach Teach Talk with Nat Damon. If you'd like to recommend a guest for a future episode, you can send your suggestion or questions to nat at reachacademics.com.